Hello and welcome back to Working for the Word. My name is Andrew Case and this is where you get an inside scoop on what can be the complex and confusing world of Bible translation. And we are in the middle of a series on oral Bible translation on an oral adaptation experiment that my wife and I did in Equatorial Guinea. And I want to begin by talking a little bit more about the philosophy behind oral Bible translation. Maybe it sounded like last time I was criticizing the whole decline of literacy in the world and people preferring audio books and audio Bibles to written material. But I wasn't really getting at that. I actually love the new technology that makes it possible to make speech and communication come alive. The spoken word at its core is hugely powerful and it is extremely ancient. So if you think about all of human history up until the printing press, most people were illiterate, most people communicated by spoken words, and if they couldn't read, they had to have something read aloud to them. Most of the early church also didn't have their own copies of the Bible, so they had to listen to somebody reading Paul's letters, reading the Torah to them, and all of those sorts of things. And so much of the beginning of the church, so much of what was the tradition in the synagogues before that, was all built around reading and hearing the Word of God audibly, orally. So in a lot of ways, the new technology that we have today is taking the fetters off of the written word, the written texts, and helping them fly. So along those same lines, I want to tell you a story that's found in this book called From Orality to Orality by the author Maxey, M-A-X-E-Y. And he tells the story of this remarkable achievement of medieval Christian literature, and it was called the Heliand, which means savior. It's a tale of the gospel written by a poetic monk who attempted to let the gospel sing in the culture of the Saxons. He rewrote and reimagined the events and words of the gospel as if they had taken place and been spoken in his own country and time. In the chieftain society of a defeated people forcibly Christianized by Charlemagne, the Saxons. Now, the Helian offers several insights, not only into the enculturation of the biblical narratives, but also into a promising reconstitution of medium, Maxi writes. This work was heard rather than read in a contextually appropriate location. The audience of the Heliand was more often to be found in the bars rather than in the monasteries. This epic poem seems not to have been designed for use in the church as a part of official worship, but is intended to bring the gospel home to the Saxons in a poetic environment in order to help the Saxons cease their vacillation between their warrior loyalty to the old gods and to the mighty Christ. So basically this monk adapted, he adapted the gospel or the gospels orally so that it could be performed in a way that reached people outside of the church. And this is precisely the kind of project that my wife and I worked on over the course of 2019. So the innovation of the translators working with us, Acasio and Canuto, has produced a genre at once familiar and novel that reaches beyond the church walls to people who would never otherwise be persuaded to encounter God's word, and that's exactly what we were excited about. There's a book called Audio-Based Translation by an author named Sundersing that I'll try to link in the show notes, and he writes, the church has been preserving the written text of the Bible for many centuries. However, the time has come for the text to be liberated from the printed pages and made available to various audience groups and media that they use. Our challenge now is to find means by which the message of Scripture may be liberated from the written mode so that it may encompass various opportunities presented by modern communication technologies. End quote. Now, we fully realize that not all of what this experiment has incorporated is replicable, yet our hope 
is that it serves to inspire further innovation within the field of oral adaptation and translation. The experiment was far from perfect, but God has used it significantly in Equatorial Guinea, and we're thankful that we got to be a part of the discovery and the excitement of the process. And we realize fully that not every translator will be as gifted as Acasio was. He was really probably a genius. But even if you never found somebody like him for your project, it would still be a worthy search and goal to have. Now, there's a, another book called New Directions in Mission and Evangelization by Schrerer and Bevins. And I want to read a quote from them. They say, Too many churches are still imprisoned by forms and structures inherited from other countries and are thus not free to establish such signs of the kingdom of God as to make use of their own cultural context. And we found that totally true in Equatorial Guinea. And so we hope to inspire more people more people groups to break free from that imprisonment. At the same time, as Maxi writes again, the gospel must be neither captive to local culture nor alienated from it. This implies a tension between gospel and culture and calls for a self-critical and prophetic stance on the part of the local Christian community. End quote. And what I can say is that this project that we did in EG has served to reinforce the fact that the significant myopia of ignoring the riches of African oral communities has led to a sad loss of opportunities for Equatorial Guinea until the advent of this project. Once again, Maxi writes, Bible translation has historically set its goal as a literary conversion of the population. Whereas literacy offers significant benefits, it should not be at the expense of oral denigration, end quote. The alternative that we have employed strives to move beyond a direct transfer of information to a poetic use of language that taps into the community's culture and its identity. So we hope this experiment will encourage others to pursue similar goals. So all that said, I want to pick up with where we left off last time and Let's listen to some more samples of what we did. That's the good stuff, right? So let's start with an example from 1 Samuel 4.1, which says, Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Nice short sentence, but the reason we're calling this an adaptation is because our translator loved to add more life, kind of like an extra bit of color to some of these scenes especially battle scenes, because he actually used to be a soldier. And so they have a traditional way of calling people to battle or to something like that. And so you're going to hear that right at the beginning of the clip. And then you're going to hear a lot of his idiophones that he does to signify the movement of soldiers and people coming together and getting ready for battle. And so he actually brings this whole very short sentence to life and it lasts for a lot longer than what I just read. So here we go. The other cool thing about building these soundscapes for the recording was that you were able to enhance things that were obviously talking about hearing things. So, for example, 1 Samuel 15, 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of Yahweh. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? So in that I built this whole soundscape. You have the outdoor sound, you know, the birds chirping, the movement of the air, the light breeze. And then you have a layer of sheep. 
and oxen that are going out throughout their entire conversation that follows as well you're still hearing that in the background kind of accusing Saul you know and makes you feel like you're right there here we go A little later on in the same chapter, 1 Samuel 15, in verse 32, we read, Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before Yahweh in Gilgal. So if you want to hear what I did with the hacking of Agag to pieces, this is your chance. Here we go. <laughs> So that was about as close as we got to making this sound like the soundtrack of a Mel Gibson movie. <laughs> Let's keep going with 1 Samuel 28.11. It says, Then the woman said, so this is the witch of Endor, if you remember this story. The woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. So this is what it sounded like with the soundscape that we designed for it. Once again, if you're not listening to this with headphones, I highly recommend it, or you won't be able to really get the full effect and pick up on the details. Here we go. <laughs> Continuing on with our survey of highlights of First Samuel in chapter 31, we have this scene. Let me give you the background. In chapter 30, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag, and they burned Ziklag with fire, took captive the women, all who were in it, small and great. They killed no one but carried them off and went away. They also took David's wives and a bunch of stuff. So anyway, as David is after them, they find a man of Egypt, a servant to an Amalekite, and he gives them a tip on where to find them. So they go down there, and so in verse 16 of chapter 30, we read, And when the Egyptian servant had taken David down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped. So we're about to hear this scene of David coming down and seeing them merry making and everything else and then the attack. So here we go. Unkunkiri, 
So I hope that gave you a really good idea of some of what we tried to do and some of the work that was involved. Um, since I was pioneering the use of sound effects in an audio Bible like this for another language group, I didn't have a vast array of sound effects at my disposal like in a pack that was already a template. And that was part of the time-consuming process. I spent hundreds of hours trying to find simple things. Like for instance, you know, you can go on some, some of these sites that you even pay for um, to get sound samples and stuff, and they still don't have some of the basic things that you need for a Bible story. And uh, even simple things that you would think would be really, really easy to find on YouTube or whatever, like the sound of a snake hissing, proved often really time consuming to find. So that was one of the things that ate up a lot of the time to make this work. It was surprising to me that when I reached out to people involved in international media services and doing Jesus film kind of stuff and other things uh, like Campus Crusade and whatever, they didn't know of anyone and they didn't themselves have any kinds of sound effect packs for Bible stories. And uh, even to buy or whatever, or pay royalties on or, or anything. So there's a huge gap there. If you're the kind of person who would love to put that together or work to, uh, you're a sound designer or know a lot about recording, that would be a great job for you to you know, say, okay, let's get all the sound effects you would need for the book of Exodus, for example, and um, put those all in one place so that translators around the world who want to do this kind of thing can replicate that. So there's a lot more to be done. I've done just a tip of the iceberg, and this can always be more professional, more organized, and so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, let's move on to a little more of the story of some of the details that we worked on for this to make it successful. Uh, whenever you produce an audio product, I think one of the important things is to have good visual representation of that product. So that means cover art that's embedded in the MP3, in the recording, or that you can put on a poster, that you can put anywhere. So each recording of each book of the Bible had its own cover art illustration that was done by my wife, who's an amazing artist with the main character or characters of the narrative rendered in color on a white background and this gave a bold iconic image while keeping the color printing cost effective. So most of the characters she made sure to draw them with mid-toned skin and dark hair approximating a Middle Eastern look as well and uh, neither Caucasian nor African and then she drew these in the Procreator app on the iPad Pro using the Apple Pencil. And that made it easier going, you know, instead of having to scan or, or get that into a digital form, it was already in a digital form and uh, we could make easy adjustments to the image if we needed to later. And then I used Photoshop to add the titles in Spanish and then in Hebrew as well. The Hebrew was a little less prominent but wanted to give representation to that and remind the audience of the original source of the material and uh, give it that foreign flavor in, in a sense. And uh, also takes advantage of the high interest that a lot of people all over the world, not just Equatorial Guinea, have in the Hebrew language. There's a sort of Hebrew trend going on in the world right now where a lot of people for different reasons are very fascinated or enamored by the idea of Hebrew and the look of it and whatever else. So. Uh, the final artwork was then embedded in the audio files as the cover art so that when you put it on your, you press play on your phone, you bring it up on your phone or whatever, it's going to show that beautiful artwork and uh, look professional that way. And then if we burned these on a disc or something, then we could have some, some physical printout color artwork on those as well. 
Now let's talk about marketing and distribution. That's the next thing on this list because that's an important part of what we saw make, make this succeed. I think this is an increasingly important part of I think this is an increasingly crucial issue in the world of Bible translation because as I said before in an earlier episode it's not special to give people Bible media anymore. A hundred years ago that was the only media they had when a missionary came to an unreached people group. They, they had no other media most of the time. So that was that was it. It was like you're giving them Amazon Prime uh, movies and Netflix and <laughs> cable and internet and books all in one package. That was like giving people a Bible back then. Now, now it's not. You have a thousand things clamoring for their attention, competing voices, and there's just millions of ways to be distracted from the Bible and from a product like this even. So what did we do to try to cut through some of that? Well, about halfway through the project, the Fong members of the team selected a name for their ministry. So we encouraged them, get a name, get a get a, a nice succinct name that'll represent what you're doing with this. And so they chose Nkualong, which means the Nku calls or sounds. And the Nku, by the way, is the log drum that was traditionally used for announcements between villages. So if there was a birth, a death, a war, if church was starting, uh, back in the Catholic days, they would use this drum, which is now falling into disuse re really fast, sadly. It's a really cool drum. So we created a group logo that consisted of the silhouette of a man in a traditional feather headdress, such as those worn by the, the usual troubadours, playing the Nku with the name Nkualong and the flag of EG emblazoned across the side of the drum. And we also recorded a brief Nkualong theme song, which was included at the beginning of every radio broadcast and the later scripture recordings. So it was an immediately recognizable melody and words that not only oriented the listener to the purpose of the group and the value of the Word of God, but also served to reignite interest in this traditional instrument and other traditional instruments. Now, let's talk about social media. How did we use that? Access to social media is restricted in the country. So, many people have Facebook accounts, but Facebook is officially blocked by the government. Uh, we created a Facebook page for the group, and um, I'll link that in the show notes as well. I think I already have in the past episode. But we created this Facebook page where we would post links to the finished recordings and occasional photos and news. But this was a dismal failure because Facebook really hasn't caught on that much there yet. And especially with the older generation that was going to be the main target audience for these recordings. But we wanted to put it out there as something anyway, and it failed. The finished recordings were also uploaded to YouTube, some of them anyway, but since people basically don't have internet or have very, very limited internet access for most of the target audience, this was a barrier to spreading the finished products that way. So distribution had to be mainly through audio files passed directly to smartphones or USB drives and through DVDs as well as memory cards. So. Here are some of our advertising strategies. When we released Exodus 1 through 15, we hosted an opening celebration for this recording for urban pastors and their families to come. And while we were playing it, we we had some free food and other stuff, and so people came just to sit down and listen. We had some visuals on the screen, but it was basic, basically still images. And uh, and then they listened, and I had in the corner a setup where I would copy the file to people's phones, and there was also a light stream pocket Wi-Fi device so that people who were sitting there with their phones could also download from the Wi-Fi directly to their phones 
uh, that and other recordings that we had. If you don't know anything about the Lightstream Pocket, I encourage you to Google that. It's a super useful device for spreading things like this digital content in remote locations where there's no access to internet. So then we took other Lightstream Pocket devices and put them in strategic urban locations. So for instance, we had one at the only Christian bookstore in the entire country. We put one in there where it's the only place you can go to buy a Bible in Equatorial Guinea. And we put one at the local Bible school in their little outdoor gazebo type thing where people come to sit and wait for a meeting or whatever else. And so while they're sitting there waiting, they can connect to this direct Wi-Fi and download the different resources on this thing. We can keep updating it with different recordings as we make more. And uh, so the other cool thing that was fantastic idea, I really enjoyed setting this all up, was putting one of those devices in one of these little public transport vans that people hop in and out of. It's really cheap. There's a Christian guy who drove one of those, and he was totally in love with our recordings and totally on board to help us. So we set it up so that this device was running in his glove box. So any passengers that got on board would sit down and they would see on the window next to them some instructions on how to connect to the free Wi-Fi in the van. And they could download stuff from there or listen to stream it from there uh, while they're on the, on the ride. So that gave some more attention to his service and helped us get it into the hands of more people that wouldn't otherwise be exposed to it. And then what we did was we printed out these big stickers, full color, that were advertising what we're doing. And uh, that there's free Wi-Fi on board for people to download Christian resources in Fang, etc. Or to listen to the Bible in Fang. And that was really nice because it was this bright kind of a moving billboard that people saw all around the city and quickly in such a small country made our recordings relatively famous. And I also took those same sticker designs and I printed some for my own Toyota Hilux truck. And so every time I went out driving around, people would look and I would see them staring at my car. And it was, it was art that my wife had done. It was beautiful, brilliant artwork that she had done for these marketing posters. Let's see, what else did we do? Well, we sent out trusted young Fong men on promotional trips to interior cities and villages, equipped with letters of introduction for pastors, light stream pocket devices, and DVDs to give away. And um, we gave out free bumper stickers with the Nkualong logo and Facebook page on them. We also played the recordings on regular radio slots with two different radio stations. And so every day you could hear a half hour of this content. And then we did some radio and TV interviews about the project. We also designed a TV commercial inviting the viewer to our office property for free downloads, which was actually on this the same property as the Bible school, where they had the light stream, constant Wi-Fi for people to come and connect. And then we did promotional church visits where with pastors that we knew, we would talk to them and they would invite us to come and talk about this at their church. And then at the end of our presentation, at the end of the service, people would come to us with their cell phones to get it copied onto them. And then we also circulated these little teasers on WhatsApp, these little short recordings that gave people an idea of what this was all about. So they'd be like, oh, that's really cool sounding. I'd love to hear the whole thing. So we would circulate those on WhatsApp because people would have enough data to be able to download short little clips like that, but not enough data to be able to download a big file of the whole thing online. And then we also asked Christian taxi drivers and long distance van drivers, like people who wanted to go to another city, you know, two, three hour drive away, 
those guys who were Christians to play our recordings continually in exchange for free USB drives with all the content on them. And uh, then we also gave away free SD cards that a bunch of people in the States, different churches donated, and USB drives as well. Totally loaded with the recordings and, uh, and other things, other content and uh, resources. Then uh, one cool thing that came about was we started giving copies of these new recordings to local pirated music stands. So this is basically the iTunes of Equatorial Guinea. You go to the market and you find one of these little ramshackle stands and maybe they have an old beat up speaker blasting different music out of it. And you pay them per song, per, per file, to put music on your phone. So they'll, they'll have a little old computer there full of viruses and they'll plug your phone into it and if you pay them enough they'll put you know whatever album from Nigeria or from whoever on there and then you've got some music. Well we gave our music to them totally free and we, were, we encouraged them you know start giving this away or start selling it. We don't care but get it out there because they're the points of contact that people are familiar with if they want new stuff to listen to. And so we, we got that out. We gave them promotional posters to put on their little their little stands and uh, started getting out there. And they even started playing some of it on their speaker so that everyone who's passing through the market could hear and be interested in it. And finally, on the radio program, we would announce giveaways of free micro SD cards loaded with our recordings for callers and this was sometimes successful at attracting callers to then give us feedback and say you know how did you hear about this or what do you like about what we're doing now let's transition to how we paid for all of this because that's a question a lot of people wonder about some of the project was financed with money from a member raised funds budget so that was from a budget that had been raised by me for this other project that was then canceled and so we were able to transfer it and use it for this project. Um, no participant was paid for his or her time so that we didn't pay the singers, we didn't pay Ganuto or Acasio, they didn't want any payment it was just out of love for their language and their country and that's the ideal. But since we had this money in the budget we decided to help with their transportation as well as a lot of their meals so they were eating with us constantly uh, while so we could keep working they wouldn't have to go home and eat and that kind of thing and then we gave them some gift offerings to just say thank you for what you've done at the end of the the project and then we had project funds that helped pay for the Lightstream pocket devices, which are extremely, extremely overpriced. And uh, I just want to throw that out there <laughs> to the people who make Lights Lightstream devices. Uh, please lower your price if you can. And advertising stickers, the posters, the radio slots cost money, TV slots. We bought a color printer, blank DVDs and sleeves, and blank SD cards. And the total amount spent from the project came to about $3,000. Now I want to stress that our model from the beginning was a frictionless model. That means that we were not going to create any friction between people and the product, people and the scriptures. We didn't want any paywalls, we didn't want any cost, any any of that kind of stuff. We wanted to make it as frictionless as possible for the Word of God to get into people's hands and into their ears. So that means we were giving away DVDs for free. We were buying these DVDs and these were with member raised funds and everything and we were giving them away. We were not charging anybody any money for these not even a nominal fee of any kind okay so I, I want to put that out there as the best biblical example especially in poor countries I'll put a link to a video that explains more of this philosophy in the show notes but I say this because it's not something you can take for granted in the world of Bible translation so if you're a person who's listening to this and 
you're thinking about supporting someone in the world of Bible translation, ask them about this. What does their mission do? Do they hold copyrights? Do they keep things under lock and key so that no one can spread these resources without paying royalties or without special permissions that they can never get? All right, so that's really important. I personally am very saddened by attitudes that I've seen in other places of people who have tried to make the Bible into a business model. And they're doing all this work to create a translation, but then nobody can have that translation if they don't pay for it. And I just think that's unbiblical and uh, counterproductive for the kingdom of God. I've heard all the arguments from the other side, all of the arguments you can imagine, how this helps support, you know, good work, blah, blah, blah. This helps keep the mission going. It helps them be able to do other translations if they have those funds coming in from people buying Bibles, etc. I don't buy any of it. So anyway, I've considered those arguments. I've weighed them in the balance and I've found them very lacking. You know, just one more word while we're on this topic. If we are called by Christ to lay down our lives for others, how are we ever going to get to that point if we can't even start with laying down our pocketbooks? If we can't make the small first step of giving the Word of God away to people for free, how are we ever going to become a generous people? If you're a media producer, if you produce Christian-related media, I would encourage you, think about how you can be generous with your copyrights to the world of Bible translation. I run into these barriers constantly, this friction that I'm talking about, where we're in these little, tiny, back-of-the-woods countries trying to get things done, trying to get the Word of God into people's hands in a creative way. And we've got all of these people who don't want to give away their images, their clip art, their video clips, whatever that they created. They don't want to give those away to the work of Bible translation for free. They want, they want all these credits. They want royalties. They want who knows what else. And I'm just really saddened by that attitude. Um, if, if you create these things, if you create beautiful images, if you take beautiful pictures of the Holy Land, for instance, that can be useful in training mother tongue translators in some small country in Africa or in Asia uh, who never will get to go to the Holy Land and can train them and, and help them visualize uh, these places before they translate. Don't charge those people money for those things. Make them freely available for them. Reduce the friction. Eliminate the friction. This is touching on some of the darker side of what you see in the world of missions where people try to use the platform of the Word of God and missions and other things to make it into a business opportunity. To convert all the hype and interest and really good people who want to give towards those things into a funnel for their own gain. If you want a resource that's really good on this whole subject of money and ministry, you should check out Randy Alcorn's book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity. He has a whole section on this, uh, doing ministry and doing ministry with integrity when it comes to money. And I think it's it's the best piece on that written so far. So let's get back to what we were talking about with marketing. One more thing I'll, I'll mention is that we filmed a music video of the song for Exodus 15. So that beautiful song that they sing after they cross the Red Sea. And we borrowed a Sony DSLR from a friend there. And uh, I used my Pixel phone for some slow motion segments. And then we edited it with Cyberlink PowerDirector. And we added subtitles in English, Spanish, and French as well. And then we shared it on YouTube and Facebook and sent a short teaser clip to people on WhatsApp. And it continues to be aired weekly on local TV. 
it was something that really got people's attention, received a lot of excitement, and many expressed amazement that something so professional had been done in the country and that it brought so much glory to God. And um, people we screened it for usually watched it several times in a row and wanted a copy on their phones immediately. So that was cool. People said that once they saw that music video, it all of a sudden gave a sense of legitimacy to the whole project, and they were more interested in listening to the recordings than ever. Anyway, if you've made it all the way to the end of this, congratulations, and thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others who might find it interesting and edifying. And if you would, please leave a review. It's a great way to help me keep this podcast going, feel encouraged, and know that it's making a difference. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.